Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Hernandez, and I'm the Executive Director of the Legislature's Nonpartisan Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity. Today's date is Tuesday, December 21st, 2021, and we are here today to conduct the final meeting of the Social Emotional Learning and School Climate Advisory Collaborative for the year. Uh, as many of you know, uh, several of you and several of us have been working uh, not only on the charges of this collaborative in our smaller groups, uh, but also preparing in our various other capacities, a lot of the advice that we will be presenting to the legislature on all issues impacting children and the school and the, the school day, whether it be adults, whether it be community, family. So I'm really excited to be able to um, end the year on substance, understanding that so much of what we're gonna be doing in the next few weeks, as we've been doing in the last few months is preparing this legislature uh, to really move the needle on so many of the most pressing needs for our kids. Uh, I'd like to offer my co-chairs, my tri-chairs, an opportunity to give a welcome. Uh, Michelle Cunningham, I think I see you there. And John Fresinelli, if you have joined us. Hi, John. Hey, Stephen. Uh, thank you for that welcome and welcome everyone. Uh, great to see everyone. Um, Again, I feel like I've been seeing many of you over the over the past couple of weeks uh, doing important work in a number of different spaces. So look forward to the conversation today and, and launching us into the next year. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. Great. And without further ado, I'd like to start, first of all, you know, so many of us have been thinking about uh, our the crisis uh, with which we are confronted on various levels, not only the health emergency, but also the emergency that we're seeing in despair in school, family, and community. And so much of that despair can manifest in crisis that is, uh, that is relatively small, but of course, 100% of the moment of whomever it is that is experiencing it, to some of the larger crises that we are seeing evolve and um, manifest in our districts and schools. So what we thought to do today is to help give some context to some of the work that we've uh, started to see in the state over the last few years to manage and address crisis. And our friends um, from the Connecticut School Safety Center asked if they could give a presentation today just to give an update on where it is that they are in creating an infrastructure of support around crisis response and opportunities. So uh, Gabriel, I would love to welcome you and your team. I know Paula's with you and Amory. So I'll have you introduce yourselves and, and take the floor. Hi, thank you, Stephen, for that warm welcome. I appreciate you uh, ha having us here today. I'm uh, Gabriel Lomas, and I'm a pro professor at Western, um, and I am the founder of the Connecticut uh, School Safety Center. And with me today? Hi, I'm Paula Gil Lopez, and I am the current chair of the Connecticut School Safety and Crisis Response Committee that serves the entire state which um, we hope will be subsumed or absorbed now by the State Center. And I'm also a, a director of school psychology at Fairfield U. Yeah. And uh, Amory. Good morning, everybody. Amory Bernhardt. I'm going to be the, uh, well, I am the director now of the Connecticut School Safety Center. And I'm um, very excited to be here. And uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of good stuff to share and a lot of opportunities. And I'm just meeting so many awesome people. and. I'm happy to be here meeting with you guys. Thank you. So can I share, I think I can share my screen if that's okay. So as Paul is pulling that up, I'll just comment that we've had so many school threats lately. So the timing for our um, launch is really quite, um, um, uh, it's excellent timing. Yeah. Thanks. So just for some of you guys who, do, who haven't met us before, just some background. Um, we've only got maybe about five slides and then uh, Amory's gonna talk to you about some of the threat assessment work that we're doing already with some schools. So, um, so for the history, when I, when I moved here from Texas in 2009, I, I was already pretty well trained in crisis management and I, I immediately got together with local superintendents 
it didn't really take um, launch until a couple until the shootings at Sandy Hook, and then I, I, at that time I established the, the Western Connecticut Regional Crisis Team, uh, um, and um, it was a voluntary team of about eight school districts, and we just got out of a, of, of a crisis team meeting that we, we meet once a month with the, with local school districts. We just exited that meeting. There was some um, probably the representatives from over over twenty school districts there. Um, people are um, very eager to have this information and to, and to collaborate with each other. Um, so uh, that, that, that work um, really um, pulled me into a connection with Paula Gil Lopez, who's here on, on, with us today. And she and I you know, joined our efforts together. Paula established a statewide um, sort of crisis response committee to help you know, others across the state who were not in my region and who wanted to, you know, to learn more about managing crisis in their schools. Paula, if you'll take it from here. Sure, sure. Um, I, I thought when I met Gabe, um, the intent was to have regional crisis teams like the Western team um, throughout the state, um, but his team had been together for so long. And the next best thing was to create the this Connecticut, the statewide committee with the hope of, um, seeding regional teams and and that's what we hope will be um, what the state center is able to do so Abe and I this was um, something a labor of love because <laughs> we ha both have day jobs very consuming day jobs and we went on a campaign to inform um, people and there are many probably on this call who we met with to build support for the for the state center um, and more organized crisis teams um, and the vision of the center was really a culmination of boots on the ground with the regional crisis team that Gabe has run for now for um, almost 10 years, um, as well as lots of training, which is um, something that the statewide committee does as well as the Western team, um, so that we can keep uh, crisis preparation as well as um, prevention in the forefront. So it's having people come and meet monthly, um, talking about after action reviews so we can learn from, from the different experiences that people have had. And, and as I said, we brought our experience and our vision to people in the state to help um, build support. Um, one of the other things that we did was we have met with various uh, state, uh, other states centers um, and, and the people who run those and um, we learned that no state center is quite alike. And so we took the best from other state models and we brought it here and it is incorporated into Connecticut's uh, vision. Thanks, Paula. And one of the things we realized is that we have to be partnered with different agencies if this is gonna be effective. Very early on, probably about five or six years ago, I was only a couple of years into running my team when administration from mobile crisis reached out to me and they said we're both responding to crises let's so we met and now when i was when, when when we respond to a crisis mobile crisis responds with us so we, we're partners in this work and, and in addition to other um, state agencies we partner in the work so both the um, our crisis the western team and the um, state committee that paula chairs they, um, we have a diverse membership. The meeting that we just exited had people who are, you know, who are uh, school principals. Most of them are school helping professionals, like social workers, counselors, and school psychologists. But we have um, um, uh, the meeting that we just exited had principals, assistant superintendents. We hope to have in the future SRO, um, um, school law enforcement represented as well, so that we have an interdisciplinary approach to training and collaboration. Mm -hmm. Shifted over, Paula. Yep. So re recently, where we're here today, it's just to give you an update. We have we received an appropriations this past year to set up this this the Connecticut Center for School Safety and Crisis Preparation. It was um, it was codified just uh, last week. It was approved by the Board of Regents, and we have officially hired a director uh, who, who who will um, you know who will be meeting with you guys just shortly. So the, the, the center is designed to serve the entire state, not just the Western part of the state. Every school in the state will have benefits from the center. So what we, what we plan to do is, is to place regional safety consultants across the state. Uh, our goal was to have one or two at every RASC. Unfortunately, we didn't get enough funding for that. So 
we are looking to have three people out in the field covering each person covering two rest regions, but they will still be working collaboratively. They'll be attending crisis meetings, helping schools with threat assessments, doing preventative work, inter, inter, in, intervening in, in active crisis response, um, setting up crisis teams, and then doing postvention work as well. And one of the other things that we have in our mission is to set up professional development with an equity-based framework so that we plan to bring you know, professional development to schools um, that's leading cutting edge work um, at a low, low to no cost to the schools. Um, we plan to collect data and conduct research trying to find out what are, what are the needs with regard to crisis preparation and what's effective and to be a state resource for curricula best practice. And we hope to be able to send out technical assistance to schools as well. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that we learned when we were um, garnering support and meeting with some of you and, and others, um, that there were three areas that really resonated with people and, and sort of differently, I think. And so we developed these um, pillars, if you will, for the center framework. And, and the first is um, social justice and equity. And this is really important because as running the, the state committee, I find that some of our members, we're it for them. So our monthly meetings um, and we have a speaker come in, um, that's it. That's all they have um, resources for. So, so while there are other districts and of course we don't, um, you know, we, we, we don't um, uh, look down on anybody for having their own resources and pulling in people, but we want everyone to have access to the same training and the same ability to be prepared for whatever comes. So as Gabe mentioned, um, the services and the training will be for little to no cost. Um, the second pillar uh, is also very important and that, that became apparent today when we had our speaker who was special FBI agent Mark LaFrance, um, the coordination between the schools and the community and government agencies and law enforcement um, that all have to have a part in a large scale school crisis. That's not always going to be the case, but um, as Gabe is fond of saying, we don't want to build the plane while we're flying it. And that's why we want to have all these pieces in place prior to um, what inevitably will come next. Um, so. Um, we want to have um, liaisons from all different um, agencies uh, associated with the center. And um, Amory has his work cut out for him, but he is interpersonally uh, gifted. So I think this is gonna be not so hard for him to have relationships. And that's really what this is about, having relationships with all these related um, entities so that we can have the most coordinated organized crisis response that we that we need. Um, and then lastly is sustainability. And um, as I mentioned before, the regional um, Western Regional Crisis Team and the statewide committee, we support many school districts um, and we get calls, we get consulted and Gabe's team even gets deployed, which we hope to um, fan that out and have that uh, capability throughout the state. Um, but we're volunteers. And, um, and so this state center is going to institutionalize this really important work for the whole state. And we feel like that is, um, so between the three of these, we feel like we have won the lottery and we feel like Connecticut has won the lottery. So I'll just start here. This is sort of our vision. And we have, um, certainly we have our state center at the top. And as you heard, we just hired our director um, who will be followed by an associate director and clerical staff and they will, they will staff the, the uh, offices at Western. Um, and then we are going to also hire three field um, crisis consultants at, the, at different satellite offices across the state. And so I just wanna point out that the regional field offices, they will have similar to the Western regional crisis team, they'll have their own crisis team, they'll have their monthly, or at least this is the vision um, that we started with. 
And then the, the statewide committee would be again, absorbed by the state center um, and have that umbrella over all the, all the different functions that Gabe shared in the beginning. Gabe, do you wanna say something else about this flow chart? Yep, I think you did a good job. Okay. So we are just preparing to launch now. I mean, we, we, we are official now. So um, um, we've, we, we're, 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 we're working. <laughs> so uh, recently we were called to, um, to help assist schools with, this, with the recent threats. Um, um, uh, Amory and I had a meeting with the uh, School Psychology Committee of Practice last week. Um, and people are very eager to understand an evidence-based threat assessment model, which um, Amory is going to share with you guys in a, in a little while. Um, so, yeah, the other um, points there on the slide are that we were born just last, you know, last week, and that and we've um, we've um, we're so lucky to have hired um, Amory Bernhard as the state um, center director. So on the exact same day, so. I'm going to turn it over now to Amory, and he's going to kind of go over you know, some of his material with you. Great, thank you. So I'll, I'll just cover a little bit of where I came from, just to give you guys a, a quick background here. So I had uh, worked for Westchester County Department of Public Safety, uh, retired after 20 years. Uh, one of the big components that I had worked on towards the end was working with our school resource officers and working directly with school districts on crisis response. So uh, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, recovery, it's very comprehensive, right? There's all these different areas of how things touch uh, building that school resilience. So I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm gonna dive into prevention here and threat and uh, you know threat assessment, but the overall picture is huge as, as you guys are all aware. Like there is a, uh, this is a, a big job, um, there's a lot of things to cover here, but I am so impressed so far with all the resources I've been introduced so far throughout Connecticut. And one of the things that I, I have developed over the years, and uh, I use the story a little bit, I, I took training once on leadership and they had me do an assessment of my personality. And the model they were using actually had uh, certain charts and you would graph certain points on it. And when I finished with the chart, I actually fit a specific model within their actually profile of a collaborator. And I remember them saying like, hey, you're a perfect collaborator. And it's one of those things where I, I don't pretend to have all the answers. Uh, however, I have a really good skill set for working with people and, and helping getting the right people together and getting answers from the right people. So I, I, I enjoy the process. I love working through the process, but I enjoy collaborating and getting to those answers. And uh, that's one of the biggest things I've found, you know, through my experience and just through my learning and, and knowledge is that uh, you, you're not going to have all the answers. But you don't need to. You just need to surround yourself with good people who want to help you and, and really accomplish the mission. And that has just led to so many great successes throughout my throughout my career and, and life so far. Uh, one of the things I was doing when I was uh, working coordinating with the schools was I went back to school for a master's degree. And if if any of you had this experience of doing a degree while you're actually um, in the field and you get to see how the academic applies to the practitioner, it's a beautiful thing. And I, I appreciated school so much more after that. And I was able to actually take things that I was learning from the schools and apply them and, and vice versa. I was able to write things that I experienced back to help support theory or even dive into some different areas uh, in the, the, you know, theoretically. And uh, this got me so, so like in tune with it that I knew I wanted to keep going this direction. So it pushed me towards my doctorate. So I'm working towards a doctorate. I'm, I'm closing in now. I'm, I'm actually, I just finished the draft of my chapter five for my dissertation. And my doctorate is on multidisciplinary school threat assessment teams. It's something I've been passionate about. I've been looking forward to, um, well, getting the doctorate done, I've been looking forward to, but just the way the, the whole thing flows and it works together. And I've been able to take things from the academic world and bring it into the practitioner world. Uh, just, it's been a beautiful experience and I've really gotten uh, so much more uh, out of schooling, uh, being in that, in that world and seeing how things go. So again, I wanna talk real quick, just it's a comprehensive approach, what we're looking at. Um, and I'm just gonna dive into one aspect of it with prevention. So if we could just go to the next slide. So this is actually the conceptual framework from my dissertation. And I'm just gonna walk you through it briefly and then I'll talk a little bit more about the models and, and things that are out there and, and some upcoming training, which we're gonna offer right out of the gate as soon as we get, we get, uh, get going here. So uh, things start with risk factors. And one of the things that uh, it is that whole school climate and 
I, it's awesome that you guys have this right here. This is this is something so powerful. Um, looking at the school climate, an advisory board to help inform legislators. This is this is like a, this is a passionate thing for me too. But it's one of those things where, as I'm looking at this, finding school climate as a measurement tool uh, was one of my big eye openers during my literature review. And I was trying to figure out how to work with the multidisciplinary school threat assessment team. I wanted to do model fidelity work. I wanted to find out how to measure it. And school climate was right there. And again, it's not a perfect system. However, it does give you some guidance and it gives you some insight as you look into these things. So school climate is a great measuring device. So I'll start with that pool of risk factors, right? These could be any risk factors. It could be the uh, school dynamics. There could be bullying. Um, you have the social family dynamics. It could be hereditary. There could also be some other uh, drug abuse or, or abuse at home. Whatever it is, there's these risk factors that all fill that pool. From that pool, those droplets of water come up. Again, I use the analogy of that water cycle and they go into that pathway towards violence. And again, antisocial conflict and psychotic, they're not the only pathways, but they're, they're pretty prevalent and they're the main ones uh, that some of the researchers talk about. So um, antisocial being the most common way and then conflict being the next and then psychotic being the rarest. So as they go into this pathway towards violence, these water droplets start to become those clouds and it starts with idea, planning, preparation, and attack. And again, this is a logical process. The attack itself and what spawned people to turn into this and, and go down this pathway may not seem logical to everybody. However, there is a logical process that people follow in these steps. When they had done their research on Secret Service on these mass attacks, even prior to that, just targeted attacks, they found that this progression followed these steps. And again, sometimes it can go quickly, but it pretty much follows these steps. And the, one of the beautiful things that we're seeing that we can really um, take advantage of is these uh, droplets of water, leakage, these warning signs that come out, these things that maybe it, it's not quite a threat, it's not quite a crime yet. However, it's something of somebody needing help, calling for help. And these things can be addressed uh, a tier one, right? The whole school district, you could talk about, you know, bullying and stuff like that. Uh, tier two, it might get more intense. And then tier three, which brings you to that level, uh, that threat assessment team, where you actually have a targeted approach. This is pretty intense. Maybe they're, they're at a level where they're preeminently going to become violent. So, uh, but these are the things that these signs are out there. And it's very rare. Uh, I think in most of the studies that I've heard, actually, uh, they've been getting up around 100% of the behaviors are, are, are visible and they have reports documenting that there are signs out there. So I think as more people are becoming aware and more people are looking for these signs, they can catch it and mitigate it. And one of the other things about threat assessment teams I think is very crucial is it's about violence prevention. This isn't a, uh, this isn't an approach to uh, label people. This isn't an approach to uh, you know, stigmatize. This is not an approach to uh, have people say, oh, this person is definitely going to be a, a, a terrible criminal one day. No, we're not predicting their violence. We're preventing it and getting help. And I had a, uh, one story, uh, it was a couple of years ago, and I remember one of the, uh, the, the police chief at the time uh, spoke out because the threat came in, the parents took the threat over social media and blew it up. They blew it out of proportion. He investigated. There was no credible threat. Did this child need some help? Yes. Uh, were there other things, mitigating things they had to put in place? Yes. But the threat was not even a, a legitimate threat. However, the child had been tried and convicted on social media. And this is one of the things I think that sometimes people pull out, oh, you're doing a threat assessment. No. Threat assessment is not about labeling or putting people out there. Threat assessment is about mitigating threats and preventing violence and getting people help who need it. So as these warning signs come down, they, you, you can see the arrow right there. They go to this multidisciplinary school threat assessment team. And coming from the law enforcement side, I realized how limited my perspective was. And uh, doing my literature review, reading about mental health, psychology, working with psychologists, working with administrators, uh, other faculty members, it really helped broaden things. And I, it really helped me see such a big picture here and how holistic multidisciplinary school threat assessment teams can be about getting that help. And model fidelity is what I wanted to study. Uh, there's a lot of different models out there. One in particular, which um, I, I really like is the CSTAG model, the Comprehensive School Threat Assessment Guidelines by Dr. Dewey Cornell. Uh, it's one of those evidence-based models. And the research on it is just really in intriguing. They have, uh, it's not zero tolerance. It's what is the specific threat? What are the circumstances surrounding that? And how do we prevent that from moving forward? And how do we get this person off that pathway towards violence? And, and the research out there is, 
is good on it. Again, there's a robust amount of research I could forward to anybody who's interested. But um, the things that I do like uh, about having the research is he can say that he has research showing that there's no disparity uh, based on race or ethnicity. Uh, that's that's so important to us, right? Are, are, are we doing things appropriately? And are we do, is it equitable? And is it social justice, right? Are we bringing the things, the, the, are we approaching this the right way? And his model does that because it dives into the details. We're not looking to say, uh, no, you did a threat. You're getting a zero tolerance. You're getting suspended. You're getting uh, pulled out of school. It's trying to keep the children and the students in school. It's trying to keep them there where they can get that help. And that's one of the powerful things I really like about his model is he has evidence to show there's no disparity on that. They dive into the details. So uh, just completely uh, coming through the rest of the model here, we have the model fidelity those teams working together, that ARMS acronym, assessment, referral, monitor, and support. And, and this drawing here doesn't represent specifically uh, Dr. Cornell's model, CSTAG. It's, it's pretty much applicable to all these different models out there. And they're all kind of built off the Secret Services, Secret Services findings. So as they come through that right there, they, uh, they come right back to that, those risk factors. And I have that little faucet letting that water out, right? Whatever it may be. It could be uh, lowering those risk factors for that specific person. It could be lowering the risk factors for the school by addressing those specific areas of bullying or whatever it may be they're going through. And you have that violence prevention. You have reduced suspensions. You have increased counseling, uh, increased parental behavior. You have students more willing to report threats. And that's one of the other big things is uh, as, as there's another study out there as these schools introduce threat assessment process and they actually tell the students that they have this, they're able to increase the student's willingness to come forward because the students understand there is a process and that they're not uh, tattling or, or the other terrible phrases, ratting someone out. And, and these things are so damaging to us to gather that information. So this process is, is huge in bringing that approval through the students to say, no, you're helping people. This isn't about um, ratting on somebody. This is about getting them the help and assistance they need to help keep your entire school safe and that person safe as well. So as those risk factors get lowered through that threat assessment team, they're able to bring down those things, um, reduce the bullying, get more student engagement, get those things that help the school climate then uh, go up. And if you notice, my ruler is actually reversed, right? So as the water level and those risk factors goes down, the school climate numbers go up, right? The school, and it depends which measurement you're using, but for the ones I've seen pretty much the higher number means the higher your school climate, the more engagement, the, the more the, the more safe people feel, uh, physical safety, uh, you know, social, emotional safety, all those things start to go up and start to increase as you can approach this. So again, does this solve all of the issues? No, but it helps us uh, have a process and have an evidence-based process to move forward and actually build a collaborative effort to help students who are in distress and who do need to get off that pathway to violence. So that's that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, Amory. So that, that kind of brings us to the to the end of our update. But just, just know that we're just launching. We don't have a website yet, <laughs> and we, we don't have any staff in the field yet. But we, we, we all of that will come with with time in the near future. We do have some collaborations already, like I had mentioned before. But we need to grow some more of those. So we will be looking to some of you guys here in the room. To help us with those collaborations, um, one one in particular, you know, when 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 Miguel Cardona was here in Connecticut, we had a we had a, a lot of good talks with the Department of Education, but we're still for some reason we're still needing to improve those talks uh, so that we can we can um, um, become more um, codified. You know, uh, for example, the technical assistance that we um, I have put out technical assistance within my network. One of the questions here from Peg Donahue was is, is um, what about a, like a template crisis plan? I know that the school districts vary greatly on their crisis plans because I see them all the time. And one of the things that I notice is that, is that some of them are stronger and some of them you know, need a lot of work. What we hope to do is to develop a template for school crisis plans that so they're gonna vary because, it's, because every school has different resources, but they should have a lot of similarity to them. And then what I've done already a few times has been like right before when COVID hit, I created an annex for the crisis plan and I sent it out to my network. But we need to have the resources like that for the whole state so that they have universal you know, annexes in their crisis plans to address all these different issues. So um, uh, we hope to continue to grow the collaborations and we hope to, in the future 
to have greater uh, resources financially so that we can grow the work and, and, and improve the safety in the schools. So that there's an email there, school safety center at wcsu.edu. We don't have a website yet, but we hope to get, you know, continue moving forward and getting all this squared away. Gabriel, this is fantastic. You know, this Thank notion you. of there's no one size fits all for our school districts, but there is a through thread of expertise and I think best practice, but also the modeling that you showed us, Amory, of response uh, is so clever and it's so needed. It's a response to, uh, to a prayer that I know is happening all over the state right now because of the crises that are, that are showing up. But I know that Faith has a question. We have a couple of minutes for questions. So Faith, I see you've raised your hand and thank you for those of you who are engaging in the chat. Thanks, Dave. Um, thanks, Gabe and uh, Paula and Amory. Um, I, you know, I, I just assume this is a given, Gabe, with all of your background with the Suicide Advisory Board. I mean, school safety, is more than just sort of threat you know um those are that that's a rare event the likelihood of suicidology and you know suicide ideation suicidal thinking you know other kinds of behaviors in school that are problematic they may lead to other kinds of things the acceleration of violence against oneself and others um you know and, and as we're thinking about frameworks you know i'm assuming you're going to work really closely with the regional suicide advisory boards because there's some expertise there um you know tying in with whether it's child fatality uh review to sort of help to take the temperature and certainly the SEL collaborative. But, you know, I think with the establishment of the regional suicide advisory boards, we're beginning to see a really comprehensive network of expertise within the regions. Um, you know, I think one of the heavy lifts, you know, people may have a crisis plan, but they don't have a suicide prevention plan and they don't have really a, you know, a, a general safety plan. Um, everybody has this sort of, you know, big crisis plan, you know, certainly after Sandy Hook, we, we all saw that. But but in terms of the day to day stuff that may be happening within the school climate, you know, I think that's where, you know, some of that heavy lift is going to be. Yeah, thanks, Faith. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, my background is mental health, and that's really where I think we need to be you know, putting a lot of our energy. And so I, you know, I hear you, I see you, and 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 I, I want you to know that we are trying to balance the center with with uh, with mental health and and with the, with other safety components. I, th I think that to to ignore the law enforcement piece of it would be would would be short sighted uh, on our part. Like school, like you know, school school resource officers when they're NASRO trained can be a benefit to the schools. And so, uh, you know, for, for me, I don't really take a position on it. If schools are using SROs, then we should be using them in wise ways so that they can improve the culture of the school. And I, and I think I, I just want to say that um, I think that Amory, as, as Gabe and I do, takes a really holistic approach. And, and the school safety part is in front <laughs> for a reason. That's where we start you know, the prevention and the protection. Um, and I think that the other piece that, that I wanna emphasize is the monthly meetings. So, and this goes back to something that Peg asked about, um, you know, keeping, keeping the crisis plans up to date. And when you have a monthly meeting, the cri crisis plans and safety plans and school climate, they're all in the forefront. At one of my meetings, I had Joanne come and talk about restorative practices. Um, so, so we give we give um, equal attention, and and I think what you said is true about you know the threat is not um, it's not all the time, but it seems to be getting more and more frequent. You know, so we have to, and that's the only reason we decided to start with that. I think Amory. And Gabe and I have been getting a lot of um, a lot of questions, a lot of requests for consultation about the threat assessment because of what's happening out there. But that's we're not going to lead with that always. That's the other thing about the center. It's going to be responsive. It's going to be responsive to the needs of the state. So I just wanted to that's say that. Great. Thank you, Paula, Gabriel, and Amory. Um, I uh, the way that we take your presentation today is an invitation as well. And I know that you in the due diligence that went up to creating the, uh, the, the momentum around the center, but also working with legislators 
is because you wanted to connect those critical dots across the state and scale a model that's been really helpful in parts of New York and Western Connecticut for the rest of the state, a resource uh, that is available uh, for our districts as they need them and as they see them to bring us back from a tier three situation to a good tier two and tier one um, uh, work that we're all working on here together. So thank you for that. Thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. And, and I know that I, I, I also, um, uh, STE and our, and, our, and our community collaborators as well through Michelle and SEL for CT are also eager to work with you. So thank you for that. Um, next, we have. Steve, yes, of course, John. I'm so sorry. Yep, I didn't see your hand up. Yep, go right no, ahead. Yeah, John. It wasn't up. I just rudely jumping in. So, uh, thanks, thanks for the presentation and for the update. I know Gabe, we had connected uh, back in uh, in the fall uh, about some of the work that you were doing, and also with uh, Bill Turley and others at um, uh, Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection. So happy to to reconvene and, and uh, see what we can do. We had a um, we had a forum uh, last week with superintendents on, on school safety, and, and part of that was walking them through the school safety requirements of the school safety and security plan, which now includes actually a mental health annex uh, for them as part of that. So aligning uh, right with with Amory with your conversation about the importance of mental health in this. So um, and again, so let's let's uh, reconnect um, with with DESP and our team and uh, and see where we go from there. Looking forward to. It. Likewise, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we have our esteemed guests from the South, uh, from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. Uh, I see Dr. Cipriano, Dr. Stramler. I think Dr. Brackett uh, may join us, but welcome, Chris and Michael. Uh, if you are going to be presenting, wrapping up your presentation on uh, some of the work that we did throughout the year. So, welcome back, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, it's so great to um, be here with you all. I was able to catch the kind of last 10 minutes of um, the presentation and just a really uh, rich dialogue. And I'd love to get a copy of that uh, model that was being presented there as well and thinking about um, how we can support uh, school safety and, and be able to link some of our resources that we offer um, through the university with um, some of the initiatives that you all are building. So just um, really, really glad to be here. So um, Mike and I are here. Uh, Mark has a scheduling conflict, so he um, is not able to join us today. But we did want to take a couple of minutes to share about um, kind of two pieces of information, one um, regarding a project that uh, Mike and I are working on, and then second, go into some resources and discussion around how to support you all with supports for um, standing up for SEL and the criti crit critiques and some of the criticisms that you may be experiencing across your um, broader communities um, as a result of uh, the national discourse and where the directions have moved. So. Um, with that, I'm going to just start and talk to you about um, an opportunity. And I will just start by saying that, you know, it's, um, it's an odd thing to present an opportunity on December 21st, when we're on the brink of vacation week and um, hopefully taking some very much deserved uh, time off. However, um, we wanted to draw your attention to a project that we recently got funded from the Institute of Education Sciences. Um, it's a four-year uh, multi-million dollar initiative to build a observation tool for um, elementary school classrooms. It's called the CELOC, the Social and Emotional Learning Observation Checklist. And the goal of the tool is to be able to support um, school leaders and schools um, in understanding what social emotional pedagogy is, so what it is that's happening in their classrooms, and be able to help to support in its um, improvement, to be able to equip your teachers um, to be better so able to support their students and their social emotional needs. And um, our tool is being developed um, with 50 school leaders, 50 school partners around the country. And um, we're here to share with you about it today because we are hoping that maybe you know a school, you know a school leader, it might be somebody in your ecosystem in Connecticut, or it might be someone that you know across your broader education um, and sociopolitical networks who would love to work with us and would love to be supported in the learning journey. And as part of that um, journey, uh, we will be building the checklist that will be with schools, for schools to use at the end of the project. And it will be um, available nationally 
to help to support schools with their ability to understand what is SEL implementation, how is it happening? And so depending upon the respective accountability metrics that um, are, um, are being requested of you and your school and district level, this tool can help to fill a much needed gap um, in that area. And Mike, any, um, any other kind of notes on the sell-off to add? I know that I've been monopolizing our time here. No, that's okay. Um, it's, I think it was a very, very good summary. One other thing I would add is that you know, part of our motivation for developing this tool came from educators, administrators who urged us to consider developing such a tool. So um, uh, for the last couple of years, few years, um, Chris's team and my team at the Consultation Center at Yale has um, been developing SEL um, practice um, survey. So teachers report on the extent to which they're implementing SEL practices. Um, and so we received some feedback from the think tank of, of educators, including administrators um, on that tool. But one of the things we consistently heard from them is that look, we also need something that can actually capture some more of the qualitative kinds of things that teachers are doing in the classroom. And um, that's where the idea for, for this measure came from, um, that we need something to be able to capture some more detailed interactions between teachers and students um, um, in, in terms of SEL practices. Um, so we're really excited to be able to have this opportunity to, um, to do this. Um, we've, we're um, kind of just in the early stages of doing it and looking for uh, more schools to come on board. Thanks, Mike. So if you know um, of a school leader or you yourself identify as a school leader who could potentially uh, be a support, um, we do encourage you to reach out. Um, I dropped some links there in the chat and we'll um, also make sure that TJ has them to send out um, after this meeting so they are stable. So if you wanna look at it with fresh eyes or with your team um, in January, um, this will open enrollment and will continue for the next couple of years. So this doesn't need to be something that you need to do now, although we are certainly excited to have some founding folks um, get in touch with us from the beginning. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, all right, so um, any questions on the CELOC or anything we could answer at this point before we move on to our next item? And actually I see myself and I don't, I don't see you all. So maybe there's a way for me to be able to view, there you are, okay, great. Um, Questions? All right, I appreciate the thumbs up and the head nods. Um, wonderful. So um, next thing I'm, I'm going to share my screen. And hold on a second. I don't think the picture went over. Let's make that bigger. So um, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see a playground? Awesome. All right. So I'm going to ask you to go to the top of your Zoom window um, and click on view options and you're going to see a, a bar for or an option for annotate. Um, you can go ahead and click annotate. Um, so view options, annotate, and then you should get a whole array of opportunity, uh, different ways in which you can actually start to draw on my screen. And so as we're, you know, ending up this totally unique year, um, and I will, I will leave it with what other words you might want to put in there. Um, I'd like us to take a minute to, to draw our playground. What do we want this playground to look like? Let's go ahead and, um, and let our artistic juices flow and start to draw. And if anyone has any, um, oh, looks like folks are getting started. All right, great. So we can draw on our playground. What is, what is the school community that we want? What do we want to see? How do we want to feel our kids to feel at school, our students, our teachers, our administrators? Seeing lots of hearts, got some, some friends look like they're starting to play there on um, the swings. Is this, a, is this a new tool for folks? Have folks just, is this a new discovery? Some yeses and some noes. Lots and lots of hearts and stars. It looks like some folks are playing together. Oh, I love that we've got some words coming up. Yes. Yeah, so my next direction was going to be if you could, if you could start to put um, 
a, um, a word or a phrase or a caption on it, feel free to go ahead and type in that text box. Um, I see a messy year and that's okay. Restoring relationships, safety, togetherness. Cell is learning. Want to feel loved and fun, understanding, firm, joy, let's play. This is a, a beautiful, a beautiful playground. Definitely a playground that I would want my children um, engaging in and that I would want to be teaching at this school and working in this space. Um, I'm gonna leave this open for another minute. And then um, in order for us to save it, I do have to request if it's okay for me to take a screenshot. Would that be okay with you all to take a screenshot? If you have any concerns about that, you can go ahead and turn your camera off, your face camera off um, in order for me to save our picture. All right, I'm going to go take a picture and look at ready in three, two, one. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us um, on that drawing. Um, can we drop one word on how it felt to reflect upon our year and our playground? That was fun. Thank you. Go ahead, drop a word or phrase in the chat. Word or phrase in the chat on how that felt. It was heartwarming, creative, hopeful, collaborative. Lots of hope coming in playful and engaging, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for participating with us. You know, something that is jumping out to me in looking at the words and terms that you shared um, in the, that you're sharing in the chat as alongside what was showing up on our playground is that it actually is kind of the opposite of some of the things we're hearing in the media and some of the experiences that I'm hearing from our teachers that we work with and our school leaders of what they're feeling right now. Um, and we know that there has been you know, a lot of negative um, attention um, and uh, negative commentary going at our school systems, at our school leaders, um, and particularly um, at the field of SEL, right? And so it's, it's rather remarkable when we think back to when we started these conversations, you know, Stephen with your group um, six months ago, and we were planning for them, you know, two months before that of, you know, how we could help to support and learn and grow with your community, um, where the conversations have gone nationally. And so, um, Mike and I and Mark, we just wanted to um, offer some additional resources and then open up some conversation if there are any questions that we could specifically help to support you all on in navigating some of these difficult um, conversations that maybe are detracting from the, the beautiful playgrounds that you all want to be engaging in on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, we talked last time about SEL and how to support um, DEI initiatives and access initiatives within SEL. We talked about the difference between, you know, CRT and SEL and any other kind of education acronym that's being thrown into the space right now. Um, and Mike uh, shared with us um, about, you know, the importance of the universal approach and, um, and how we have to think about our operational definition in our framing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop some resources in the chat and turn it over, Mike, if you had any notes that you wanted to share before we open it up for questions. Yeah, so um, I think probably many of you have heard of what I've called the, um, actually as a colleague of mine who kind of coined this term, the Trojan horse of um, SEL. Um, many of these arguments are coming from conservative organizations, but um, the argument being that um, social emotional learning is um, a, um, a ruse or a, um, or a Trojan horse for indoctrinating uh, students into progressive modes of thinking um, and or introducing critical race theory into education. So, um, 
there's been numerous articles. Um, uh, many of you have probably seen them. Um, there have been many uh, debates and arguments uh, occurring in um, board meetings um, across the state and across the country. Um, and um, I think what Chris has put in the chat is some resources regarding to regarding uh, responding to some of those critiques about um, what social emotional learning is and what it isn't. Um, and so that uh, that list of documments um, is that, do you have that in the chat? I see it. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Thanks, got, it looks like there's lots yeah. of folks in there right now clicking around. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you do you want to summarize, Chris, what that? Yeah, what that absolutely. So is. for I see that there's a lot of folks in there. And just so you, like, we'll make sure that this gets emailed out afterwards. We're going to keep this up. And then it's also, it's editable so we can add to it um, if it's helpful or you yourself have something you'd like to add. And it's all um, publicly available resources. You could get these links anywhere, but sometimes just having them in one place can be um, really useful, especially if we're in a in a um, experiences of high stress. So um, we've got um, quick references from Castle um, that have been put together. So five key messages if you're needed to communicate about what is SEL. Um, some of the frequently asked questions um, that we've been hearing across the nation and ways to respond. And there's also um, one C, it's a web page of useful videos. They're short video clips. And so if you're feeling like your school community or your district or your group could benefit from a quick two or three minute video, um, more so than hearing somebody talk or reading something, um, they're really, really well done um, resources and ways to share information. And they can be also like sliced and chunked if you want them to come out, go out in shorter um, movements. There's also, I have the full Google Drive of resources linked in there, if that's something you wanna just have on disposal or share with your team. Um, and then um, item three is a guide that um, uh, Mark uh, Brackett, Dr. Brackett and our team developed uh, at the YCEI to leading difficult conversations with emotional intelligence. And so some of this um, and some of this content really speaks back to um, where we started in our, in our discussions as a group back this summer, earlier this summer. And um, the science that um, Mark and our team has been building over the better part of a decade in helping to support um, an emotionally intelligent education and training. And then number four is um, just a couple of media articles that Mike and I, and, and a podcast that, that's come out recently that touches on these topics, if um, that's a, a form of consumption that you find helpful and useful. Um, and then um, lastly is our... Um, updated meta-analysis for the field. And the kind of last piece I'll share on this um, just to kind of put some visibility on it. So if you read through, um, as a cell enthusiast, if you read through Castle's framing and kind of all of the excitement around like why we support SEL, um, there's something, something pretty important to keep in mind, which is that the evidence base for SEL is, is pretty out of date at scale. And so um, this is something that we as a field have known, and there's a lot of reasons why part of it has been contributed to as a result of there being many varying definitions of SEL and how the field has de developed and evolved the time that it takes to conduct a meta-analysis or a large-scale study. And um, the um, anyway, so long story short, I could talk about this stuff all day. We um, embarked on doing an update to the state of evidence for SEL, um, Mike and I and our colleagues. Um, and we have a um, systematic review of disability and race representation in SEL interventions that is coming out. Um, there's an Edweek article that's linked to it here. And then we've got a updated meta-analysis, which is an update to the 2011 Durlach et al. paper in child development that we recently had accepted to child development um, that will be coming out next year that really gives the full like what is it, who is benefiting, and how. And there's some really key components of here that we need to keep in mind because SEL from 2005 or even 2015 is actually different than what many of the programs would consider to be SEL in 2019 and 20 and how we think about the components of SEL, the intra and interpersonal skills, how we monitor implementation and implementation of fidelity, the tools that we have at our disposals, right? There's many, many different factors. And so if you find yourself in a space or conversation where somebody is kind of pushing against it, um, we encourage you to like look to our, and that's the OS, the open science framework link that's there. We're gonna be updating this 
because um, the way that we're building this evidence base is to be free and publicly available for the field. It's totally visible and trans. So you could look, you could say what we're, we're concerned, you're concerned about mindfulness. Let's look at what the evidence is for mindfulness among third graders with these particular backgrounds, like we're, we're gonna have it all cataloged. So um, there's no more kind of questions or guessing or assumptions being made. We'll be able to say what we can say with confidence and what we can't, and then use that as opportunities to, um, to build resources. So that was a lot of talking. I actually just wanted to answer questions. I'm gonna stop there. Mike, uh, any uh, questions? comments. So I see there's stuff happening in the chat. I'll take a second to take a look. Any any questions or comments to elevate? Yes, Andrew. A uh, math specialist in a school district I was talking to told me that for her, for her people, what she hears is that all SEL means is that her the kids don't have to do the work. That when they when she goes and works with kids, the teacher says, no, 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 don't press the kid SEL. Can you please respond to that? <laughs> I I find it to be um, completely. Uh, I I am I am yet I'm I don't know why I'm not surprised, but I'm still surprised when I hear, particularly our math and science teachers, that can push against um, SEL and talk about it as not being something that's in their classrooms or for their students, so that it undercuts or undermines, you know, the work that they're trying to do and the rigor of their classroom. Um, because I'm pretty sure that all of us have met a student with math math anxiety. I'm pretty sure all of us have met a student who has encountered a math or science topic and had a moment of kind of frustration or confusion or anxiety that may or may not have inhibited our ability to be successful with that. Um, and so when we think about, you know, what SEL's role is in the classroom, when we, when we think about, we have, to, we have to look at those competencies and what those competencies are. If we're talking about being able to regulate and manage those emotions so they don't override my ability to attend to the phenomenal math lesson that has been prepared, well, then it, then it deserves to be in every classroom, right? Then it helps, to, it helps to create the playing fields so that you're available to learn it. Or you have the child who has had experiences of you know, stigma or bullying or victimization, who's not gonna wanna participate or go up to the front of the room or join in that chat or put their video on, right? It, it, has, a, it has a space there because it actually sets the foundation. It's the runway to be available to learn. I don't know that I directly answered your question, Andrew. I think I just gave you a lot of ways in which you can answer it, but happy to talk about it further if it's helpful. And just to add to that, I think yeah. um, you mentioned this point of you know pushing students, and I think I think it's a, pushing students is a is an important SEL skill to to be able to negotiate. Um, some people call it academic press, for example, and um, it can be very challenging to figure out how to push students in a way that um, leads them to more um, intrapersonal and academic growth and doesn't push them beyond their limits to the point where they're becoming um, frustrated and disengaged with, with learning. Um, so from the teacher's per per perspective, like that requires you know, quite a bit of skill to be able to negotiate. And that's where I see um, social emotional learning coming into play in terms of what the teacher is doing with the student and understanding the student that he or she is, is, is working with. Um, just, um, it, it, so in math, it's definitely relevant. As Chris mentioned, there's quite a bit of math anxiety. Um, uh, it's very common. Um, and um, it's important for a teacher to understand that and um, understand how, how to push students in a way that doesn't dis discourage them and only encourages them to continue um, learning. We were just talking about this um, about a month ago um, in a board meeting that um, I was a school board meeting I was a part of and this math teacher was presenting on her approach to um, engaging students in this way. And she talked about the importance of um, growth mindset, for example. Um, uh, so that is the idea that um, intelligence can be grown. It's not um, just an, an internal um, static characteristic that one has, um, that if you fail at something, you get something wrong. Um, the idea is to um, engage in um, in a different strategy or more effort to, um, uh, to, to uh, overcome the, uh, uh, the, the failure you just experienced. And so those students who have growth mindsets and feel like their intelligence can be grown are more likely to persist 
at challenging problems, whether they're math or other academic approaches. I, I, what I'm, the argument, the issue that I'm seeing is that SEL means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yes. And um, um, it, in a lot of cases, and particularly because we're rating teachers on it so heavily this year, um, it, it means, you know, uh, again, being very supportive and not pushing kids out of their comfort zones. And so we've got, I think we've got to be a lot clearer on what SEL is and, and what SEL is not, perhaps. I, I agree with that 100%. There's um, a wide range of perspectives on what SEL means. There are various frameworks as well. I think that's important to mention. Um, so we've mentioned the, um, the CASEL framework of the core competencies, but there are many other frameworks. Um, Stephanie Jones at Harvard has categorized, uh, if you wanted to check that out, um, I'll see if I can find the, the link for it. Um, and relatedly to that, Mike, we've got it up on, if they click on the 5A and on our, um, up on our meta, you can actually see, we've got it all cataloged out. It's like 713, don't quote me on the number, um, different, different indicators within it of like what could be SEL. And it's based on Castle's five fives framing as analyzed by Lawson in 2019, which actually extends the five alongside um, Stephanie Jones and colleagues um, easel. Um, framing. And so we, we did a crosswalk of the two and then it's every like additional competency that's popping up as we're moving through, we're adding, continuously adding to it. So you can really put words to it of like, what is it that we're talking about? Um, and, and, and uh, Andrew, I also heard you mention the how coming up too that there was an element of like, it's how the teacher is engaging with it. Like how are they, just because there's what the kind of curriculum says or what they think the approach is, there's also this whole piece that's been yet to be fully unpacked, which is part of what the CELOC, which our tool is going to help on, of the how, how the teacher is engaging in social emotional teaching. What does that really look like? And how does it look like um, with, with equity at the center? So how do you attend to emotion variability in the classroom and the wide diversity of your students and how they will express in a way that is equitable and attentive and responsive and not punitive or pushing a particular right way to feel or you know, reducing a focus on academics? Doctors Cipriano and, and Strambler, I just really wanna thank you for coming back, for really providing these resources you know, I, I love the fact that you've compiled a series of resources and, and really acknowledge that there are different ways in which we can communicate concepts that are accessible to different people in different contexts. And that's important. And it's important that in doing so, we have the information that is critical for all of us to understand, which is this is a skill set, it's part of learning, it's part of success, long term success. But then again, it needs to be accessible as well, supported in the school, supported through community effort, and, um, and also through this collaboration. So we appreciate you. There is so much that we're, we are going to be doing in small group in reevaluating our laws and how it is that we put more supports in prevention and intervention into our laws and make, it, make them less prescriptive on the due process side, which is really what, what has made us focus on um, uh, focus on the back end of the work rather than the, the, the front end. So again, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Mike, and we are excited to see you again in the new year. I wanna, uh, this is certainly a last but a not least, um, I want to now introduce Tanya Barrett, Senior Vice President of 211 Health and Human Services at United Way. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if it feels like this is a little bucket of resources, it's because that's what it is. We wanted to end the year with resources for the viewing public and for you to start thinking over the break about how it is that we can continue to collaborate. Tanya, you're gonna showcase for us some of the work that the United Way is doing. And I'm just so proud that you're here with us today, Tanya, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, so like Steve said, I am Tanya Barrett, the Senior VP of the 211 Health and Human Service Division here at United Way of Connecticut. And I'm here today with Heather Spada, who is our program coordinator for um, something that you'll learn about, the Gizmo Initiative, 
and our suicide prevention efforts. Um, Heather, do you want to say hello? Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Great. So we're going to quickly, quickly kind of take you through our um, specialized services and crisis intervention. I am going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay. Is everyone seeing my screen? Yes, great. So um, by the same token, give me a thumbs up if you've heard of 211. Excellent. Um, so most people giving the thumbs up. So I think um, what we wanna do is make sure that you're aware of some of the specialty services that we've developed over the years. So for those of you who know 201, 201 provides 24 seven information and referral, crisis intervention and disaster assistance. And um, last year we handled about 3 million requests for assistance to connect residents to help. And you can see by this um, chart, uh, healthcare and COVID uh, vaccine and testing sites information was the highest volume, housing and shelter, food, utilities, and then mental health and addictions. We also offer online our um, information about the community resources. For people who may not know what they're looking for, we've created a mental health category page, which people can click on and use the categories underneath the mental health uh, page to understand what the array of services looks like and what they might be able to access. So that page has mental health care, adult counseling services, child and youth counseling services, and then connections to uh, support groups. I should mention that all of our services can um, be accessed on phone by dialing 211 or over the web at 211ct.org. And we do offer um, language line interpretation for those who don't speak English. And those who are hearing impaired can use 711 to access 211. So our specialized services in crisis intervention, um, Connecticut is actually uh, a gold standard 211 in that we provide information and referral as well as crisis intervention. They call that in the INR world a blended center. Um, and we're lucky to have um, such really great coordination between DEMIS, DPH, and um, uh, DCF around the suicide um, advisory work, the suicide prevention work, and um, that has come together to offer a wide array of services that I'll talk about uh, now. We're certified by both AIRS for our information and referral work and AAS, which is the American Association of Suicidology for our crisis intervention work. And we actually just completed our latest recertification of AAS and our evaluator actually um, told us that she would like us to apply for center of excellence award um, based on all of the services and the quality of the services that are provided. So we were very happy to hear that. So not only do we handle calls from people who call 211 um, directly in an emotional crisis, we also answer the lifeline. So the 1-800-SUICIDE number or the 1-800-273-TALK number and coming soon the 988 number. In Connecticut, we're lucky because all of those numbers will continue to ring to our 211 crisis intervention um, trained bachelor level staff who take these calls and help people to um, figure out options. So last year, last calendar year, 
2020, we actually handled 122,000 uh, crisis calls. And those crisis calls consist of behavioral, emotional, and situational crises. What's important to know is that 91% of those calls, the crisis was diminished um, by the 201 contact specialist simply talking with the caller, getting them connected to other resources, and only 561 or less than 1% of those calls required active rescue or medical emergency response from 911. Um, so that we're very proud of uh, because kind of points to the fact that people need somewhere to call to be able to um, regulate and to uh, diffuse their crisis and, and figure out next steps. The newest specialty service that we have is um, the Action Line. This is funded by DEMAS. And it is another number, 1-800-HOPE-135, um, that people can access um, crisis intervention as well as mobile crisis teams. Um, and again, you don't have to know all these numbers. Um, any one of them will get you right to um, 211 services. The Action Line operates 24-7, 365 days a year with multilingual staff or interpreters available also. And there's the Youth Mobile Crisis Intervention Services. Um, I think um, the first presenters talked quite a bit about the um, interactions between youth mobile crisis and, um, and the work that they're doing with the school security. Um, this has been a very successful program in that um, DCF um, restructured the program, I want to say about nine years ago, to create a consistent access point through 211. That access point um, ensures that there is a consistent statewide response to people who have a child in crisis. Families uh, simply dial 211 and press one for crisis. And then they need to press one again for mobile crisis intervention for youth. That's very important that they press the right options because we do prioritize our calls um, based on the crisis, uh, the nature of the crisis and um, those calls would be handled first. So anyone can call. Um, on behalf of a youth or a child. And um, the, the idea is for our staff to really talk with people, help determine what the crisis is, do a safety assessment. We have several assessments that we do based on our accreditation and work with um, DCF and DEMAS. And to get a mobile clinician out to the home if it's mobile hours. Um, currently, the Youth Mobile Crisis Program uh, offers a mobile response between not, uh, 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday and Sunday, 1 to 10. Outside of mobile, crisis, of mobile hours, our 211 um, clinicians, so we have licensed clinicians on staff that provide an emergency response after hours. Um, and can arrange for a mobile clinician to go out um, the next day. So in FY 2020, there were 16,548 youth mobile crisis callers. This um, number is actually down from previous years. Schools are our greatest referrer um, and due to the pandemic and the cycle of schools being um, interrupted, um, we've seen a dip. We saw a dip in FY 2020, and we'll see a little bit of a dip also in um, FY 21. Um, but we're very happy that um, 
DCF is really looking at the mobile hours and trying to figure out how to also increase the mobile hours so that even parents calling after 10 or before six in the morning um, would be able to get a mobile response. So they've been working on, on that and how to expand the hours in a thoughtful and productive way. So with youth mobile crisis, Again, you know, we're seeing this 91% um, were appropriate for a mobile crisis response team. 6% of the calls actually were really people looking, they weren't in crisis, they were looking for the traditional information and referral that we provide. And then 3% required um, the 911 intervention. That's for the youth mobile crisis part. So um, I am actually going to um, stop here and then let Heather talk a little bit about um, the Gizmo Initiative, which is both prevention and a response um, initiative and uh, one that gets a lot of fanfare. Um, kids love it and, um, and adults too, uh, because it really focuses on wellness and health and um, planning, you know, and this is an effort um, with the Suicide Advisory Board, DCF, DPH, and DEMIS, and United Way of Connecticut, um, really working to get um, Gizmo integrated into school systems. Um, Heather will tell us more about that. So Heather. Thank you, Tanya. Just give me a shout when you want me to flip. I will do that, I appreciate it. Um, thank you for this opportunity, and I am going to do a really brief high-level overview and then encourage you to please visit the Gizmo website um, for more details and certainly contact me um, if you would like a, a further conversation and more information. Um, as Tanya set this up very well, this was a group effort and continues to be, um, as you can read some of the highlights here on this slide, that, um, that we are implementing not only here in Connecticut, but across the country. Um, and this has been a wonderful venture. Um, it started utilizing a federal grant that was awarded to the state of Connecticut um, to address youth suicide prevention. And, um, and what we did is when we were doing our research and looking for um, resources for elementary school age children, we did not see very much that would be very upstream suicide prevention and utilizing that mental health promotion piece. And um, we looked at the um, 2015 school health survey results and, and those are given to ninth to 12th graders in our state. And the three things that stood out to us is that um, one third of those students could not identify an adult in whom they could trust and talk to. A quarter of those students said that they could get the help that they needed in time of crisis, only a quarter. And then also a quarter um, of students um, were saying that they felt sad or hopeless at least every day um, for over two weeks um, during the school year. And so those things we said, you know what, we can probably address this starting in elementary school and maybe see eventually if can those things change as the students get older. So with Gizmo, um, what we see are two features in particular is that it increases the capacity um, for that person, that young person to strengthen their own mental health. So increases their capacity. And also um, it encourages that connection to an adult or more than, more than one adult in their life that they can trust. And that those two pieces have been very key um, to the success of this and the embracing of this. Um, next slide, Tanya. So here are some of the features as far as um, what the Gizmo Initiative um, incorporates. And you'll find all of this on the website that is there. Um, most of these are of no cost. Um, everything I, on here except the elementary school curriculum um, is, um, is a $300 curriculum that um, engages 25 children. Um, and it can be used whether it's in school, in an after school program, um, different therapeutic settings, even a boys and girls club and, and those types of situations and atmospheres have utilized it as well. We have tried to make most things available online at no cost. Um, so individuals can utilize this no matter what the setting is. Um, and in particular, the read alongs, the, the number four or the fourth bullet point there um, has been very successful. And um, I encourage you to, um, to look online to, um, for these details. Uh, next slide, Tanya. 
So as, um, as we mentioned, this was homegrown in Connecticut. And here's the timeline, the very condensed timeline of what we've been able to do um, in 2017. Um, that was when the start and it was launched in, in September of 2017. Uh, we are also able to, um, to again, to um, have a website platform that we continue to update and use as a repository of information, not just for young people, but also for the adults, right, in their lives, whether they're professional in mental health school, um, even the school librarians, public librarians, and parents themselves as well. And, and we're trying to expand that more and more as we receive feedback. And you can see on the right, the picture there is, um, is the curriculum kit itself um, that has some of the features that are there. And online, um, there's a better description that's there. The guide itself um, comes in English and Spanish. Um, and our goal for next year in 2022 is to um, develop the curriculum to be in Spanish as well um, and to, to increase and expand um, the materials um, in that way. Uh, next slide, Tanya. And then our, our last slide here, um, just wanted to highlight again, some of the lessons and utilization um, of, uh, of, of the gizmo um, pieces, not just the curriculum, um, but starting with the guide and increasing in, in those um, activities and resources that we have. I just wanted to highlight that we have used um, data, whether um, it is national and also Connecticut data to inform what we've done from the initial design and activity development to, um, to informing the curriculum development and its implementation. It went through um, several different pilot um, types of, um, of studies that we have done in order to make those improvements. And the Connecticut school systems have, um, have really informed the process as well as other stakeholders in the community. And it has truly been a, a group effort in all of this um, and parents as well as providers have um, provided us a great amount of feedback. Um, and you can see it's in Connecticut, well over 3000 students have completed it um, and, and 48 elementary schools and 200 classrooms and after school programs. And that certainly has increased over this past year. Um, we are excited that it's been implemented in multiple states and, and also Alberta, Canada reached out to us and, and they are piloting it in some of their elementary schools. And I have most recently, been able, been in contact with some tribal nations in Nebraska and Oklahoma. Um, they're starting with the read along activity with, with their um, students and youth in their communities. And they're looking to, um, to then to, to increase in order to um, utilize the curriculum piece as well. So we're interested to see how they can even inform more resources that we have. And we have a pilot that is um, we've been working on with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And then I also just want to mention too that we're um, consulting with the Office of Early Childhood and how to utilize this for home visitors as they go in to work with parents and children. So we're going to have an um, early childhood focus for resources as well, um, as well as um, an adult expansion and how adults can care for their mental health as they care for their youth right, and, and, and increasing their mental health capacity. And also we're um, going to be looking um, and working with Department of Children and Families and how, how can this be, be tweaked and augmented to help children who have been through um, various trauma and how this can help to, to segue and support them as they go back um, into the classroom, um, into the, um, the environments that, um, that they may have been taken out of in order to help to, to bring healing to them. So more to come, please visit the website. I know we're so out of time. Um, feel free to reach out to me if I can um, provide any other information. Thank you very much. Yeah, and um, thank you, Heather. Heather. And just to close, um, you know, we really see Gizmo as something um, that could really be introduced more widely in school systems, particularly in the elementary um, grades, to get kids and parents talking about wellness, right? And um, so we're excited about kind of thinking that through with various groups and what that might look like um, to have a, a broader statewide implementation of Gizmo. So thank you, that's it. Back to you, Stephen. Thank you, Tanya and Heather. And you know, I, I have to tell you, uh, we, if we continue to focus our resources and our efforts 
in those spaces that we are seeing the work work, like two on one, and and also the promise of the new center uh, that um, that we heard about earlier. If we continue to focus our investments and the things that we know work, we know that we're going to do a lot better by our people here in the state. So I just want to appreciate you. I want to appreciate the United Way for all that you do and continue to do. Uh, uh, it's just really powerful to see Gizmo in action, uh, and it really is life-saving work. So thank you, Tanya and Heather. Uh, I, I know that there are going to be questions. I'm glad that you put your contact info there because either anyone from the public who wants to reach out to you to reach out about, uh, learn more about Gizmo, and of course, everyone here in our collaborative as we move forward, uh, that's a great resource. So, so thank you so much for that. And with that, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today at our collaborative meeting. Uh, as we move toward the end of the year and into the new year, I just wanna thank all of you. I especially wanna thank uh, our wonderful guests for today uh, who presented on, on uh, various tools and resources that we can all uh, rely uh, on together and also continue to build. We have a lot of work to do. The month of January is gonna be as dynamic, if not more, as the last few months have been for us because uh, I think each of us is being asked for what are our next steps, what can we achieve now, and what can we build together as we move into the funding season. So I wanna appreciate each and every one of you as we move toward the close of the year and the beginning of a new year and uh, invite you uh, to find uh, ways in which you can nourish yourselves, heal yourselves, uh, because we've got a lot to give as we move the new year. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your week and happy holidays.